Inventions that have changed the world. So as many as you can think of, 30 seconds go with the people next to you. Somebody, uh, somebody throw one out to me. Let's, let's see what we came up with. Inventions that changed the world. I bet we got some good ones out there. The printing press, the potato. Well, okay, peanut butter changed the world. What else? Uh, the wheel, just like the tire. I, I agree with that. Plumbing, yeah, thank God for plumbing, right? What else? What are some other ones? What'd you say? Bones. Oh, phones. <laughs> yeah, phones. Phones change the world, right? Maybe one or two more. The refrigeration. It's good. I, uh, I came up with a couple of them. And maybe this isn't a, an invention here, but fire. The usage of fire. Can you imagine the first time someone struck up a fire and, and watched it burn? Touched it? Maybe got burned a little bit? Um, riding animals, that's an interesting one. You're walking across the plains, it's taking you forever. You see a, a horse just galloping across the plains, and you're like, wow, that would be much faster. Let's try to get on that thing. That to me would be a, a, a bold move, um, but change the world, right? Carriages, cars, change the world. Taco Bell, change the world. Fast food restaurants change the world, right? As quick as you can imagine, you got food right in front of you. Airplanes, light bulbs, electricity, Alexa. I just have to yell at Alexa and it tells me all the answers I ever need in the world. The printing press, some of you, some of you guys have mentioned that, the iPhone. Joggers, joggers has changed the world. We're uh, a little bit more casual than we used to be, a little bit more comfortable than we used to be. YouTube. Social media, Stanley's, Stanley Cups have changed the world, cameras, um, mirrors. Have you thought about that? The first time somebody looked into a mirror and saw themselves for the first time, mirrors changed the world, right? There are a lot of different inventions that change the world, but tonight I want to share with you guys seven words that personally changed my life forever. Not just seven words that changed my life, but I'm convinced seven words that have changed the world. These seven words are right here. Go and make disciples of all nations. Since talked about this last week, but I wanna, what I want to do tonight is I want to build on top of this idea. Last week, Sims took us through the idea of what it looks like to live for spiritual multiplication, to make disciples. And tonight, I want to focus in on the second half of this, which is all nations. Go and make disciples of all nations. And it's kind of crazy because this is our last late night of the entire year. And uh, I think it'd be cool to kind of just look back the last couple of weeks and see where we've come from um, to get to this point. We looked at, at the very beginning of the series of being a, uh, or living for a legacy. We looked at being a spiritual leader. How do I invest in other people to help them grow in their faith, to help them learn about their faith? We learn how to communicate our faith, the importance of the story of the gospel, which just means good news. How do I communicate the fact that Jesus has rose from the dead and that he died on the cross for my sins and it's changed and it impacted me. It's given me an opportunity to have a relationship with Christ. How do I share that with other people? We learn that if we want to leave a legacy with our life, we've got to communicate our faith. We learned what it looks like to live in light of eternity. Not just what we say, not just uh, what we think, but how we spend our time. The decisions that we make, how do we live in light of eternity? Living for a kingdom, the kingdom to come, not for a garage sale, right? Because the things that we store up on this planet, at the end of the day, it's not going with us. Are we going to live for a kingdom or are we going to live for a garage sale? We're going to live in a light of eternity if you want to leave a legacy. 
Then last week, like we were talking about, or I just talked about, Sims talked about living for spiritual multiplication, making disciples who make disciples. And it's kind of cool. We did this pretty intentionally. When we look at leaving a legacy for our life, we thought through what is the best way to communicate to those who are coming to these late nights how to live for something that lasts, that outlives their lives. Um, if you look at these different topics, you can see a couple different things. Being a spiritual leader gives you a lifestyle of how to live for a legacy. Communicating your faith, it is the cure. It's the answer. It's the thing in which we revolve our lives around. It's the thing that we revolve our communication around. It's the thing that gives people hope. Living in light of eternity, that's the motivation. So you got the lifestyle, you got the cure, you got the motivation, and then you've got the method. How do we actually do this? How do we actually see world impact happen? How do we actually see our friends, the communities around us, this country, the world impacted? The method's right there, living for spiritual multiplication. And we kind of come to this night where we're wrapping it up. And I want to step back and give you a big picture of what the scope actually looks like. So we're wanting to impact one person at a time, right? We, we care about the people around us and God does too and he wants to use us to impact them. But how far does he want it to go? What does he want the reach to be? Well, he's pretty clear what he wants the reach to be. He wants the reach to be the entire world. He wants the reach to be the entire world. And here's the key thought tonight that I want you guys to walk away with. is this, God's heart is to impact the world and he wants to use you to do it. God's heart is to impact the world and he wants to use you to do it. And we see this in one of the most famous verses of all time. And I've heard it so many times that sometimes I tend to actually skip over it. But my encouragement tonight is that we don't skip over this truth. Because one of the greatest, most powerful truths of all time, John 3, 16, for God so loved what? He loved the entire world. And he proved that by what he did. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. So the question I ask is, who does he not want to see perish? Well, we see in 2 Peter 3, 9, that the Lord is not slow in keeping the promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. The scope is the world. And the number, the amount that he desires to see come to know him and have a, a thriving relationship with him and live in eternity with him forever, it's every single one of them. It's all eight billion, the entire world God desires to impact. And it's kind of interesting, these seven words have changed the world, it's changed my life, it's changed the scope of all of history because Jesus, right before he went into heaven, he said this, go and make disciples of all nations. Like I said, I want to focus in on this last part, all nations. When you look at the Greek word for nations, it's this word ethnos. And this word ethnos is defined as people of the same race or nationality or who share a distinctive culture. And so this is indicating this, that yes, there are a number of nations in the world, but it's even more specific than that. God's more specific than that. He says every culture, every people group, every different language, every skin color, every single human on this planet has inherent worth. In Genesis, it talks about Imago Dei. We are the image bearer of God. There's not a certain race. There's not a certain nationality. There's not a certain spot on the planet that God cares about more. He lifts them all into the same category of John 3, 16. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. And so it's interesting when you look at the actual Greek word, ethnos, and it really does, it really does show you that God cares for every single person on the planet. He's got a desire to reach them. The issue, if you will, with this is this. There's a website called Joshua Project. Some of you guys might be familiar, familiar with it. I would encourage you guys to go look at it. Basically, what Joshua Project is, it's a website that's dedicated to describing the entire earth 
looking at the different people groups, all the ethnic cultures of the entire world. And then it describes kind of the Christian movement or the movement of how God's working all over the world. Those who have come to know who Christ is, where there are movements actually happening and in places where it's not happening at all. So God's desire is to reach the entire world. We can see this, the ethnos or the nations that Joshua Project as they've done their surveying, as they've done their studying, as they've done um, their kind of examination of the world, they come to find out that there's about 17,444 different ethnic groups in the entire world. The number of those that are unreached are 7,387. And I'll define unreached here in a minute, but that's, that presents a pretty interesting dilemma, right? Pretty interesting issue when you look at God's Heart and his design to reach the world, yet there's still 7,387 people, groups in the world that have not been reached. And that's 42.3% of the entire world. And when you look at it on an individual basis, like the actual numbers, that's 7.93, or uh, sorry, that's 3.36 billion people. And this is even a little outdated. Um, there's been some progress since, but we've also increased in our population over time as well. And so tonight, what I wanna do is I want us to kind of look at some different people groups of the world. I want us to look at the unfinished text. I want us to look at a video that kind of describes this unfinished task. It's gonna be about a five minute video. There's a spot on your handout to kind of jot some, down some notes. There's some staggering realities um, with this truth. And so I want you guys to, to Write down anything that might stand out to you guys. I did want to set up this video a little bit. Um, it it kind of talks about this mission that has started from the beginning of time. And really, if we look at it from Genesis, which is the very first Bible, or the very first book in the Bible, all the way to Revelation, which is the very last book in the Bible, there are 321 different times where God talks about the word nations. And how he desires all praise, all glory, a relationship, an intimacy, or an intimate relationship with every single person and all of those people groups. And you see that from Genesis all the way to Revelation. This mission has been rolling since Jesus died on the cross. And it's been going since the beginning of time. It's been a movement that has been growing ever since that moment when Jesus rose from the dead and he went back to be with the Father. And I think if you could see all that God is doing around the world, you'd be mind blown. Like, you'd be shocked. I am convinced of that. If you can get in the God seat, and you can go to the place, different places in the world, and you can hear some of the stories how, of how God has impacted them and how people have come to faith, just like people have come to faith in this room. Some of you guys, for the first time this year, have decided to start following Jesus. That same power, those same stories are literally happening all over the world, yet the mission still re remains unfinished. The task still remains. And there, there is some significant work being done around the world, but there's still some significant work to be done. And so I want to show you a video that kind of explains this unfinished task. Justin knows them. I've got some, I'll have some thoughts. And I'll post it. We'll discuss it a little bit. And uh, let's see here. Is, do you want to uh, go to that slide that says unreached Sims? It's kind of got the definition there. There you go. I did want to uh, kind of give you guys a definition of this because I mentioned it a couple times and I mentioned it earlier, but an unreached people group is this. An unreached people group is unreached or least reached people is a people group among which there is no indigenous community of believing Christians with adequate numbers and resources to evangelize this people group without outside assistance. So it's kind of uh, self-explanatory there. An unreached people group is those who don't have access um, to the story of Christ. And so let's go ahead and play that video, take some notes, we'll talk about it right after it. I bet you've seen one of these before, but I bet you'd have a hard time finding someone who hasn't. This book is the most widely known and most printed book on the entire globe. So in today's world, when everyone is so connected, information is so accessible, and Christianity seems to be so widespread, is the Great Commission to go out and make disciples of all nations still relevant? Is this final command from Jesus outdated? While this book is the most widely printed, 
Did you know that over a third of the world's population has never seen it or even heard its message? There are over 3 billion unreached people on the earth today. Unreached meaning they have never heard of Jesus because their entire community has never heard of Jesus at all. But the world is already filled with missionaries, right? So how can this be true? Well, there are a lot of missionaries, but most of them are in places where Christianity is at least somewhat familiar. And here's the reality. Less than 10% of all the missionaries around the world exist in these unreached areas where entire people groups have never heard the name of Jesus. That's right. 10%. So while we are doing a lot as the global church, there still remains that giant void we seem to have missed. What if there was a way to radically change this? To fill the void? To reach the unreached? It's that question that motivated a group of believers in 1993 to travel to Soviet Russia, where Christianity was still a crime. Churches were burned down, torn down, confiscated by the government, turned into any function and any purpose other than houses of worship, houses of spiritual instruction. Our meetings were underground with believers who had been in and out of prison. And they were taking great risks because they had a great passion to see God do something very unique in their countries. And they had paid the price of being faithful in the midst of the hostile environment that, that was taking place. And we happened to come along and they would say, well, you gave us so much. And we said, no, we didn't give you half as much as you gave us. We received these teachings whereby somebody even without formal training can be able to go and test forgiveness for Christ as long as he has the calling and he has the zeal and he knows the truth. God can use it. As the gospel spreads, it captures hearts. This leads to a church planning movement. And we are seeing these church planning movements happen all over the world. There was this one man in Asia and he became a believer. He learned how to share the gospel. And as he's being trained by one of our national partners, he realizes this is what God created me to do. As he began his ministry of going out and sharing the gospel, he was seeing new people coming to faith. He's training those people to go out and do the same thing that he is doing. The end result is churches are being planted and the church of God is being multiplied throughout his nation. We are dedicating our lives to taking the most important story ever written to people who have no hope, who if they don't hear this message, then they continue to live in hopelessness. But ultimately, it started with that one person taking that one step of obedience and God using that one step of obedience to change his life, to change his community, and to ultimately change his entire nation. Go and make disciples of all nations. There are hundreds of thousands of words in this book. Why do these seven continue to be so important? Since the beginning, God's desire was always for his people, every single one of them, to know him, to love him, to feel his presence. Every person on this planet, God desires a relationship with. Just like he desires one with you and with me. But there are literally billions of people who have never even heard his name. And it's our joy to share that name with them. So the real question is, what will you do to help reach the unreached? or the magnitude of the mission is kind of crazy to think about, but the magnitude of those seven words echoes not just here in Manhattan, Kansas, but it really does echo to the ends of the earth, to the countries that are even furthest from us, and it's the hope. 
It's the hope that, that we need here, and it's the hope that they uh, need across the world as well. And some of that can be kind of heavy. It can uh, be intimidating to think about. Um, but one thing I always like to remind people is God is on this mission. He's the one who wants it more than we want it, and he's actively moving this mission forward. And he actually invites us into being a part of this in a pretty practical way. We don't necessarily got to pick up everything and go right now. Maybe somebody will Maybe someone will do that. Um, I'll be very surprised if that's the case. But God has a purpose and a practical way for us to live this out now. Um, some thoughts to build off of that video and questions that come from it. One was uh, something that she mentioned. What if there was a way to fill the void? What if there was a way to reach the unreached? She mentioned that ultimately it did start with one person taking one step of obedience and God using that one step to change the world, which I think is pretty encouraging for us in this room, is what is that one step for us? We just got to figure out what that one step actually is and just start to take it, to be involved in what God is doing around the world. She mentioned, why do these, or asked the question, why do these seven words continue to be so important? The, the same words that changed my life when I saw them for the first time, and the, one, the same words that are changing the world even as we speak. Every person on this planet God desires to have a relationship with, she mentioned. What will you do to help reach the unreached? So pretty powerful and motivating video. Um, if any of you guys want that, I've got the link to it. Um, you guys come hit me up later. But it reminded me of a, a movie. Have any of you guys seen I Am Legend before? Who's seen that movie? I just don't want to be a spoiler, spoiler alert type of guy. Um, well, I Am Legend is... One of my favorite movies, and I think it's one of my favorite movies, it's one of my favorite movies after I've started following Jesus, and the reason why is because I think it's a image or a, um, a picture of what is kind of going on right now with the gospel and with um, God trying to, to reach the world for his glory. Um, in this story, there is a disease that kind of takes over the world, and there's a few people who are left on the planet um, Will Smith, I don't remember what his, uh, his character's name was, but he in that story was one of the only guys left on the planet. He was a scientist, and so he dedicated his time, even though he was lonely, it was him and his dog and nobody else on the planet, or so he thought, and uh, he spent his time trying to investigate a cure, and he literally spent hours, days, nights, months trying to find this cure. And about three-fourths of the way through the movie, there's two other uh, people that showed up that weren't infected with this disease, because if you were infected with it, if you've seen the movie, you basically turn into this mad eating zombie. So it's kind of scary, kind of messed up. But uh, he, he was uh, trying to find this cure. These two people uh, come on the scene, and about that exact same time, he actually found the cure. He was using some of the, uh, the, uh, the people who were captured or the people who were, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They actually had a disease. He were, was using them as test subjects to be able to test some of his cures. And eventually, towards the end of the movie, he ends up finding his cure. And as he finds his cure, um, what ends up happening is he gets surrounded, his house gets surrounded, it's the three of them, um, by these zombies. And as these zombies are trying to break in, what he does is he takes the cure and he passes it to the two, and then he basically sacrifices himself and he detonates a bomb. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm sorry. If you haven't watched it, it's still worth, worth watching. Detonates a bomb, he destroys all of the zombies in that, that scene. These two get off and they find a community and they get the cure to this community. And I was thinking about it with John 3.16. John 3.16, God says he loves the world so much that he gave it a cure. And that cure, we've got it right in our hands, Jesus. He died on the cross for our sins to give life to us. And it is the answer to have a relationship with God for everybody in the world. Now, since talked last week, our best and most effective way to pass that on is to multiply it, is to, to show people how to start a relationship with Christ, but then also to grow up and mature in their faith and then learn how to do that for somebody else so that eventually it can multiply. Best method, right? But what if that those two individuals just kind of took it to one community, and in that community, they're like, hey, this is great. We got to the community. At least we're saved. We're good. But they know that there are other communities out there. Their task from that point 
If they love other people, is to take that to the other communities, to the next community, to the next community, even if they don't speak the same language, right? You gotta have a heart for the, the human race, even if they don't have the, you know, the, the same mindset or the same beliefs or the same culture, you're gonna take this and you're gonna pass it on. And I think God's heart is for us to do the exact same thing. And I've got five ways, just five hopefully easy ways for us, maybe just choose one of them, to begin to step into this mission that God has asked us to be a part of and honestly given us the honor and the privilege to be a part of. First one is this, it's an easy way to do it, is to pray. God responds to prayer, he hears it. And like I said earlier, he desires to reach the world more than we do. And I guarantee you, he's using the prayers of people all over the world as they're praying specifically for that cure to get to the next generation or to get to the next country, to the next people group. God hears those prayers. A couple different resources I would give you here is Operation World. It's a phenomenal book. Jason, the author of this, Mandrick, he did a incredible amount of work. It's unbelievable. He studied people groups all across the world. And on there, he's got prayer points. He's got things that, that this, this, these people groups or the, um, the nations that you'll be praying for, what they struggle with, the hurdles they have to believe in Jesus, their belief system, their belief background. He's got it all on there and even prayer points to go along with it. Joshua Project is a very practical one as well. It's an app. You can download it. And on Joshua Project is where I got a lot of my uh, information for tonight. If you download this app, it gives you a people group, different nation, different ethnic group that doesn't have the, the message of Christ, pops up on your phone. You can literally spend a minute, two minutes praying for it. It gives you points right there to pray for it. Very practical way, not just practical, very powerful way to be involved in taking a step to be a part of this mission. Um, giving, you know, that's, this is an interesting way to get involved, but there are people who are going around the world. Jesus is very clear that we're, your money goes or your heart goes as well. If you invest in other people who are maybe on the field, maybe in some of these unreached places in the world, you can connect with churches. There, you know, churches have people that they're supporting. Um, you can do some research. There are different mis mission agencies out there. Um, but my encouragement is to not think about how much you can give, but think about, well, how can I start to give? And it doesn't got to be much. It can be just something little, you know. You don't have to do it, but it is a way to get involved in what God is doing around the world. Because in the Bible, the, the, uh, God says that when, when you give to a person who is on the field like that, that you are also a part of that mission. You're partnering with it. God sees it as you both being on the field. It's a way to tangibly, right where we're at here in Manhattan, Kansas, get involved in the work around the world. Um, and here's another one. This one's the one that kind of maybe gets people a little bit more nervous is going. Not everybody's going to be called to go to the, the tribes of the Philippines or, um, you know, in, in the mountains of Nepal. Not all of us are, are going to be um, commissioned or, or uh, thrusted out to go do those things. Uh, I'm guessing most of us, majority of us in this room will probably be sent to some of the communities, metropolitan areas around us, and God wants to use you there. But... For some, God might put this on your heart. God might use this in your life, and he might ask for you to consider going. And th there are different ways to do this. You don't gotta go forever. There are people in this room who are gonna go, be going on a short-term version of this. They're gonna be going overseas to the Philippines, to South Africa, to uh, India. And uh, there are actually some in this room, I want y'all to stand up if you're going on a summer team, um, somewhere overseas this summer. Go ahead and stand up. Give it up for them. These guys are taking this interesting thing they're looking at. Thank you guys for sitting. It's just kind of cool to think that this isn't just a, a mysterious, arbitrary um, thought that maybe some people will go. Some people in this room are deciding to do that uh, this summer, and God's going to use it in their own life, but I, I think God's going to use it in some really cool ways in these places that they'll end up as well. Um, I think another one is to, uh, oh, I've got to share this real quick. Um, so this is a group of dudes that I was just kind of uh, allowed to walk alongside. And some of you guys have seen this slide before. Um, but the reason why I share this is because they were in your shoes. They were literally, they, they spent time coming to late nights. Um, they came to faith when they were in uh, a school here at K-State, their freshman year. 
And when they graduated, they decided, hey, we just want to give a couple of years to investigating this. And uh, they're not like these like superheroes. They're just really normal dudes who decided to say, hey, I, I want to be a part of this somehow, some way. And you got uh, some countries represented of where these guys are currently at. I think Gabe's actually back in the States, but he was in London for a little bit. Um, the, you got India up here, Australia, the Philippines, uh, Thailand, and then that's actually my little brother. And he's going all over the world doing some mission work um, as well in my case state here. And so I'm staying right here with y'all. I ain't going anywhere. But it's kind of cool to think about these guys who were in your shoes, who were spurred by the same seven words that, that I was spurred by, that a lot of people in the world were, were spurred by. And they just kind of took that step. And said, hey, God, I want to give you uh, this time. I want to I be a part of this mission. It's not going to be everybody's um, future, but maybe it is going to be for some of y'all. And if you do step into that, you won't regret it. I think the fourth one is to welcome. And this is just kind of cool to lift up our heads. We're on a college campus. There are, are people around us um, that are from all nations, that really do have um, all kinds of backgrounds that come right to this campus and and uh, I would say this, I think one of the greatest way God works is he, in Acts 17, mentions that he has placed you where you're at on purpose. He desires to work, or, uh, with the, uh, work amongst the people that are around you. And so think practically about that. If you're in the dorms or on a dorm floor or you know, you're in a fraternity or a sorority, you, you think about that practically, that's not by coincidence, God says. He says it's very purposeful, very intentional that puts you there because he desires to work among uh, the, the men and women that are around you, your friends. He cares about them um, as much as you do and probably more. Um, and it's, it's cool to think about that reality because I do think that that is probably the main work or the main um, ministry that God's wanting you to do right here and right now, the people that God puts you around. But on a college campus, we're interacting and moving around and, and meeting and seeing people all across the world who are in our classes or who are eating lunch right next to us. Consider just saying what's up to them, you know, saying hi, starting a conversation and seeing what their background is like and welcoming them even into um, a friendship, but maybe even into a relationship with Christ. Um, the fifth one is this, and I think the most practical one for us right here and right now, I just mentioned this a little bit, live for making disciples today, right here, right where you're at. It really is the greatest contributing factor to helping the world being reached. And the reason why I say that is because those guys that I met that are all over the world right now, I met them right here. Who knows what God's gonna do with them? Who knows where God's gonna send people? Who knows where God's gonna send you? You might be in Kansas City, but one of your friends that might come to faith and maybe their direction is going to be an internship or a, a job in Japan or, uh, you know, fill in the blank. It could be any story. I really do think that this is the greatest way to live for reaching the world and being a part of this mission is to live to make disciples uh, today. Go and make disciples of all nations. Seven words change my life, change the world. And I think if you enter into that same exact mission, God will use your life in some really cool ways and he'll reveal some things to you as well. God's heart is to impact the world. He wants to use you to do it. And I want you guys to take some time just to, to kind of look at your notes, some of the thoughts that jumped out from you with the video or uh, to you from the video. Go ahead and talk about what from the video inspired or challenged you the most. Um, what can you start doing in order to live for the world, uh, for world impact today? Uh, talk about that with people around you, and then Caleb's going to transition us after that. <laughs>